of God at First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. We are an open, welcoming, and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, which means this. You are welcome here. You are safe to sing or laugh or shed a tear. You are welcome here if you are happy or sad, confused or inspired, full of faith or full of questions, young or old, poetic or pragmatic, or a combination of all of these things. You are welcome in our community, no matter your religion, your ethnicity, who you love, wherever you grew up, how much money you have, or the color of your skin. For here, we proclaim that each person is valuable, loved, and essential. This is a place of peace and grace where all God's children have a home. Here, all are loved and no one stands alone. You are welcome here. All are welcome here. Yes, friends, you are welcome here at First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. First Church is an open, welcoming, and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, and we are so glad you are here. We pray that this service gives you hope, even with the darkness in our own lives and in the world. 
We hope that this time together provides a sense of comfort and inspiration and reminds you that you are loved no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. Perhaps this is your first time worshiping with us, or maybe you've been in this sacred space many, many times. Regardless, we hope you feel connected, loved, and appreciated. Our community is one that focuses on inclusion, generosity, compassion, service, and gratitude. As always, we encourage you to look at your reminder newsletter and blast emails and get involved in this vital and vibrant family of faith. This community is filled with all sorts of ways to engage in learning, fellowship, service, and so much more. Now please join with us in our opening prayer and the Lord's Prayer. God of such beauty and majesty, wonderful and holy is your name. Great are you, God, and greatly to be praised, for you are the creator of all that is and all that ever will be. The seasons and all of our days you hold in your hand. We acknowledge our total dependence on you for every breath we take. Yet such dependence is a joy, for you are good and loving, abundantly generous, and always working for our peace and the peace of the world you love. Give us a reverence for the renewing of your creation, beginning, loving God, with us. And may our lives be a never-ending prayer of gratitude, hope, and action. We pray in Christ's name, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we invite you to join in our opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. today. 
Wow, you must have been really paying attention where in our pre-production meeting we talked about what we were going to talk about today. I am loving this whole getup. <laughs> Doesn't she look beautiful? Well, in case you can't guess, today is our Vacation Bible School or VBS kickoff day. <laughs> so today, Mrs. Bear and I both got dressed up for the occasion. As you can see, she has a fabulous outfit on. And I think you did a better job than me. I even spilled a little something on myself, but you know what they say, the show must go on. <laughs> so here it is. Our VBS theme this summer for the first week in August is Discovery on Adventure Island, the quest for God's great light. And the theme verse this year from our scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verse one. Arise, shine, your light has come. The Lord's glory has shone upon you. And so in this VBS, we are going to have a week long um, celebration of God's love and to learn about how God's love shines through each one of you and you. It is August 2nd, which is a Monday through August 6th, which is a Friday. And we start every day at 8.45 in the morning, goes through 12 noon, and we have science, we have crafts, we have games, we have snack, we have mission, and we have music. We've got it all. And each day there's a different um, Bible story that we'll learn about, and we will connect it to our verse, our scripture that we're learning, and the theme. And as you can see, Mrs. Bear is very into this theme. We are very prepared. Um, we are hoping for and planning that it will, it will be in person this year, outside. Um, but as you know, things may change, so make sure your adults stay tuned for all the details from Miss Lauren and Mrs. Bear. All right, well, that's what I want you to know. I also want you to know that sometimes it can be hard for us to share God's love, and I understand that. And if you can't share God's love, I at least want you to be open to God's love, to receive it yourself, so that in the days to come, you can share it with others. Okay? All right, you know God loves you. I love you. And <laughs> Mrs. Bear definitely loves you. All right, stand up and look at your adults and say with me, may the good news of God's love be with you. Let us pass the peace. Let us join our hearts and minds in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, Easter has come and gone, and yet our call from you is no different. We are your beloved children, challenged to live out our faith and to truly be Easter people. But let's be honest, God. Like the disciples, we are sometimes afraid, sometimes full of doubt, sometimes just plain lonely. But in your boundless love, you appear to us in our fear and love us in our doubts and grant us the oceans of your peace. Thank you, God, for loving us just as we are. Creator, God, again we come to this time of worship with hearts broken. More violence, God, more racism, more hatred. Another news story that takes our breath away. God, we haven't yet recovered from the last one. Some of us are paralyzed with fear. We fear for our own lives, for the lives of our children and our children's children. Some of us, God, are angry. What is happening to the world we love? Oh God, some of us just feel numb. Years of images of violence have dulled our senses. And some of us feel hopeless and helpless. Despite how we feel about another act of violence and hatred, gracious God, we know deep down that we are called to do something, to speak out, to stand up, and to work for justice. We are your Easter people. 
And as your Easter people, we know that we are also called to live with thankful hearts, even when we feel sad and the events of the world weigh us down. Hear our prayer, O gracious God, a prayer of thanksgiving for the gift of good days, for the survival through hard days, and for the promise of new days. We give thanks for the life and faith and mission of this congregation. Despite being separated, we are united. We are together, connected on this journey of life. Creator and holy God, we now pause to offer our deepest prayers to you. Hear now some of our voices spoken out loud and some of them silently. O oh God, Holy One, creator of us all, help us, guide us, and remind us that we are to be your long-distance runners in the race for peace, for justice, for love, and for righteousness. Remind us always of our call to be your faithful, loving, and dedicated disciples in all that we do and say. We pray all this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. In these weeks following Easter, the prescribed lectionary readings try to give us a picture of how those first disciples responded to the glorious good news of the resurrection. And in last week's wonderful sermon, Kim Sirio, drawing from the passage from the Acts of the Apostles, spoke about how those faithful disciples were of one heart and one soul and that there was not a needy person among them, for as one community, they cared for anyone who was in distress. And looking closely at that passage, it was actually a time of prayer that helped them to be united and filled with an active love for one another and for their world. For as much as these earliest disciples were basking in the joy of the fact that Jesus was still alive, they nonetheless faced some very real problems. Personal doubt epitomized in the person of Thomas, the continuing oppression of the Roman occupation, and the very real danger of violence at the hands of the Jewish authorities, as witnessed in the stoning of Stephen. No, life was not all hunky-dory, all peaches and cream, nor a bowl full of cherries for those early Christians. Nor is it for us today. We too, too could be singing along with Robert Preston in The Music Man, You Got Trouble. Right here in River City, trouble with a capital T that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. Well, in the prescribed psalm for the third Sunday of the Easter season, the psalmist is also in trouble, and we are about to hear a song asking for deliverance from the enemies that the psalmist was facing back in the fifth century BCE. Fifth century Israel, first century Jerusalem, or our own 21st century world. No time in human history is without its problems, its challenges, its troubles. And no individual faces a life without trials and tribulations. And certainly this past year has had its fair share for all of us Yes, a fair share of trouble, and, and trouble that begins with the letter P. But the psalmist has another P word that might just be the answer to our troubles. Let us now listen for that other P word. Hear now these words from the fourth psalm. 
Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it in your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. May God add a blessing to these holy words. Ezekiel saw the wheat way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheat all the way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith, and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel, a wheel, a wheel, a way in the middle of the air. Better mind my sister, how you walk on the cross. Way in the middle of the air. Your foot might slip and your soul be lost. Way in the middle of the air. Way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel away in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by the faith. The little wheel run by the grace of God. Be a wheel. In a wheel of rain in the middle of the air Let me tell you, bro, what a sinner will do Way in the middle of the air It'll talk about me and it'll talk about you Way in the middle of the air You'll see some song we'll away Way in the middle of the air You'll see song we'll away In the middle of the air Has set you free away in the middle of the air. Why don't you let your neighbor be away in the middle of the air? You'll see you saw the sea, you saw the way up in the way up in the sea, you saw the sea, you saw the way in the middle of the air. Way in the middle of the air. Friends, today's sermon is brought to you by the letter P. Sometimes a single word defines an era, and it is fitting that during this exceptionally difficult past year, a single word immediately comes to the fore, and it is a word that, yes, begins with the letter P. You see, based on a statistical analysis of words that are searched for on their online dictionary, Merriam-Webster's word of the year for 2020 was, of course, pandemic. Not a big surprise. Well, if pandemic has been the word of the year, what has been the letter of the year? Well, based on David Taylor's meticulous algorithm analysis of all the words written and spoken over the past year, the letter P, of course. Without a doubt, P has clearly been the letter of the year. 
You see, during this pandemic year, we've had PPE and PPP. The pandemic has taught us all about personal protective equipment and the Paycheck Protection Program. You see, during this pervasive and persistent pandemic, the letter P has become prominent in providing people with a possibility of protection. If our primary healthcare professionals had only, had only had the right PPE, and if only employers could participate in the PPP, then they would find some potential and promising protection in the midst of this pandemic. Well, as people of faith, in addition to PPE and PPP, we have POP. P-O-P. Like the earliest disciples and like the psalmist, we have the power of prayer. Answer me when I call, the psalmist said, O God of my right. You gave me room where I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. In the scripture introduction, I made the case that the 21st century is no different than the troubled times of the 5th century BCE or the 1st century. So what troubles in our lives, in our nation, in our world are needing our prayers today? Shall we name just a few? With this week marking our observance of Earth Day, global change for one, global climate change for one, racism and racial injustice for another, children and families on our southern border fleeing their dangerous homelands, the COVID-19 virus, of course, 18,000 children every day dying needlessly from hunger. For most everyone, some degree of uncertainty, loneliness, anxiety, despair, depression, and the everyday ups and downs of family life. And of course, weekly mass shootings, the latest being on Friday. And so today I would offer some thoughts for you to consider about POP, but not just the power of prayers but the power of a prayerful life. As preacher William Sloan Coffin once put it, what counts is what we might call prayerfulness, an all-pervading attitude of heart and mind by which any activity in our lives can become a prayer. Anything from eating, sleeping, shooting the breeze, comforting one another, serving a hot meal to the homeless, marching for peace. And then Coffin continues, this is not to minimize the importance of prayers, but to stress the importance of prayerfulness as an all-pervading attitude. In other words, prayers are critically important as we face life's critical problems but just as important is a prayerful and active life of faith. Perhaps the simplest illustration of this point comes from this cute story. Two little girls were cutting through a field on their way home from school. An angry bull began to chase them. One girl screamed in fright, let's stop here and pray that God will protect us. The other girl, a bit wiser, said, no, let's run and pray. True prayer should never be just words, no matter how piously spoken. Prayers must be embodied in our lives of faithful action. For example, in response to our nation's ongoing gun violence, and mass shootings, le leaders often immediately offer their thoughts and prayers. 
many people rightly feel that this is simply not enough. And I think the 16th century English martyr and devout Christian Thomas More would agree, for he once said, the things, good Lord, that I pray for, give me your grace to labor for. The things, good Lord, that I pray for, give me your grace to labor for. Two centuries later, Ralph Waldo Emerson made the same point as Moore and Coffin, but in words not quite as gentle and kind. Emerson didn't mince words when he said, prayer that craves a particular commodity is vicious. Prayer as a means to effect a private end is meanness and theft. As soon as a person is at one with God, he will not beg. He will then see prayer in all action. The prayer of the farmer kneeling in his field is to weed it. I guess the modern rewriting of this thought is, pray as if everything depended on God, work as if everything depended on you. Now, I don't think that Emerson, Moore, or Coffin would deny the importance of intercessory prayer when our lives and our world are filled with trouble with a capital T, as in times of illness, grief, or suffering. Rather, they simply want to stress the importance of a prayerful life as we go through life's joys and sorrows. A prayerful life offers a concern to God, but then takes action that God would want us to take, rather than waiting for a Santa Claus, Santa Claus God to get around to our wish list. Commentator Leonard Sweet believes that most of us, unfortunately, take our prayer lives most seriously when we are trying to pray our way out of something rather than pray our way into lives of faithful action. He writes, when you're rushing to get an appointment that you're already late for and don't notice the police car until you've whizzed halfway past it, time to pray your way out. Or when you walk into a math class and suddenly realize a chapter test is today and not tomorrow, time to pray your way out. One must wonder whether God doesn't spend the better part of the day hearing attempts by people to pray their way out of difficult situations. It must get very old for God. But actually, as we heard during the Lenten season now past, Jesus himself got to a point in his life when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane in his time of trouble when he authored one of the classic greats in this genre of prayer, Father, get me out of here. Then later, as his eyes gazed upon the cross, Jesus wondered, Father, can this cup be removed from me? But then, instead of praying for an escape hatch, instead of praying for a way out, Jesus offered this prayer, O oh God, your will, not mine. For Jesus, the essence of prayer was surrender, surrender to God. The essence of prayer is living one's whole life in a prayerful attitude. Prayer is not something that we just do with our lips. Prayer is something we do with our lives. From the little girl retreating from the angry bull, no, we'll run and pray. To William Sloan Coffin, prayerfulness, an all-pervading attitude of heart and mind by which any activity can become a prayer. And Thomas More, the things, good Lord, that I pray for, give me your grace to labor for. 
I conclude with a story from this past week, which was in the Muslim community in the United States and in the world, the beginning of the holy season of Ramadan for the second year in a time of pandemic. At the Islamic Center of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, the Imam kneels to pray throughout the day and the impact of the COVID-19 virus remains on his mind. We're praying for protection for our communities, our country, and the world, he said this past Tuesday. This is a hard time for many, and we're trying to stand together to get through it. Ramadan is, of course, considered a period of introspection, spiritual discipline, and communal, communal prayer, and includes a daily fasting from dawn till dusk. More than a billion Muslims around the world celebrate this sacred month-long event. It's a month of peace, kindness, and love between humankind, the Imam said. Our prayers hopefully manifest themselves in a renewed dedication to giving by reaching out to the poor and the hungry, people especially facing the challenges of these troubling times. And then he, con he concluded, there is a lot of need right now, and we're trying to help others right now, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims too. Whether we are Muslims, Christians, or Jews, we are all brothers and sisters. Our Ramadan prayers must always lead to lives of active engagement in our world. Friends, this sermon was brought to you by the letter P. And yes, there is an awesome power in prayer and an awesome power in prayerful lives given to others with care, with compassion, and with love. You know, it's interesting Sometimes we think prayer is our attempt to cajole and change God. But really, aren't we the ones who are really changed by the power of our prayers? We'd invite you to join in our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Let us join our voices together in this affirmation of faith. We believe that God creates all things, renews all things, and celebrates over creation. We believe Earth is a precious sanctuary, a sacred planet filled with God's loving presence, a home for us to share and to care for. We believe that God became fully human, became a part of Earth, and shared life with family and friends. We believe the Spirit renews life in creation, groans in empathy with a suffering creation, and waits with us for the renewal of creation. We believe that the risen Christ continually calls us to offer our prayers and our prayerful lives to celebrate, revere, and renew all that God has created. Amen. Over our years of teaching confirmation class here at First Church, Kate and I would almost always have a session on prayer. We'd hand out this uh, sheet of paper with ha which has a variety of prayers, long and short, and ask our confirmants to pick out their favorite ones. This is now available on our website if you want to see it yourself. They most often were struck by some of the shorter prayers. For instance, by Dag Hammarskjöld, for all that has been, thanks. For all that shall be, yes. A Jewish proverb, Dear God, help me get up. I can fall down by myself. One that is quite popular, Good morning, God. I love you. What are you up to today? I want to be a part of it. But the prayer I close with is another prayer by Dag Hammarskjöld, who, as many of you know, was Secretary General for the United Nations until his untimely death in 1961 when he was on a peacekeeping mission to the Congo and his plane was shot down. This is his prayer that I leave you with. Give us a pure heart that we may see thee, a humble heart that we may hear thee, a heart of love that we may serve thee, a heart of faith that we may live thee. Amen.